thank you for joining. My name is Alan Schroeder. I'm a clinical professor in, in pediatric hospital medicine and, and critical care, and I co-chair this seminar series with uh, Dr. Rajni Matthew from Pediatric Infectious Disease. Uh, we launched this series last week, and I think a few things have happened since then relating to this pandemic. So uh, lots to talk about today. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, COVID vaccines, um, and we'll get to that shortly, and Dr. Matthew will introduce the speaker. Uh, up uh, next week, we're going to talk about schools. And uh, after that, we have a, a more didactic session by Dr. Arvin uh, going over some fundamental principles relating to uh, virology. If we can just get the next slide. This is uh, how to get CME. Uh, if you like, you text code uh, that number to uh, the phone number listed there, and that will be a different code each week. Um, so before we get to the, the main session today, we, we are um, going to start off each successive week with a, a presentation by a trainee. Uh, these will be evidence quick hits where we review an article of relevance that was published in the prior one to two weeks. And for this week, uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Sunny Duong. He's a third year pediatric cardiology fellow from here at Stanford. Um, he's gonna be leaving us next year to do uh, an advanced imaging uh, fellowship uh, in New York City. Um, and but this week is gonna be a little bit different because Dr. Duong will be presenting uh, unpublished data. Uh, most of the time we'll have uh, peer reviewed data published in medical journals, but uh, we thought this topic uh, obviously is receiving so much uh, national attention currently uh, that we thought it was uh, worth presenting what little we know at this point, in part because we're already hearing uh, about inquiries and demands from some of our patients and some of our families. So, um, uh, Sunny, why don't you take it away? So I'll be talking about Regeneron's um, Regen CoV-2 antibody cocktail on um, PGY6 and pediatric cardiology. So uh, this is not an FDA approved use of this medication um, and the data are not peer reviewed. I sourced this data from the company's website and an investor webcast. So um, as you all know, um, President Trump uh, contracted COVID-19 about a week ago um, and was very quickly given um, this um, region CoV-2 antibody cocktail from Regeneron um, uh, under a compassionate use request. Um, and actually late last night, um, Regeneron asked the FDA for emergency approval uh, for this drug that Trump uh, on Twitter claimed uh, cured him. So I thought it'd be uh, very helpful to go through what exactly this monoclonal antibody cocktail was. Um, so this is uh, two monoclonal antibodies uh, that uh, were found to bind to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and prevent viral binding to the ACE2 receptor and allow the virus to be cleared without entering the cell. Non-human data from Regeneron showed that it can be used as prophylaxis and also help um, clear virus uh, from um, the system better. Um, so uh, Regeneron designed a seamless phase one, two, and three trial to test the safety, antiviral efficacy, and clinical benefit in symptomatic non-hospitalized patients. That's this trial that I'm gonna be reporting, symptomatic non-hospitalized patients. The endpoints were the viral load as determined by the nasopharyngeal swab, uh, doctor visits, symptom relief, pharmacokinetics, and adverse events. And importantly, this is an interim analysis of the first 275 patients enrolled, but they're targeting more than 2,000 patients for enrollment. So um, adult non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients uh, with symptom onset less than seven days before randomization um, and a SARS-CoV-2 infection confirmed less than three days before randomization uh, were, were randomized either to a low dose, 2.4 grams, a high dose, 8 grams, or placebo, um, and uh, were monitored for 29 days after infusion. Uh, President Trump got the 8-gram uh, dose, if you're wondering. Um, so the mean age was around 44 years, um, with a large proportion of them being um, Hispanic, um, and uh, the majority of them had um, greater than um, or equal to one risk factor for severe COVID-19. And didn't show the data, but the randomization will show that there is well-balanced uh, baseline characteristics across treatment options. The, um, they made a distinction between patients that came in who already had endogenous antibodies. Those were that was seropositive, and those that did not have endogenous antibodies. Um, and they found that patients that had endogenous antibodies had a lot lower viral um, titer in their um, nasopharyngeal swabs uh, to start. And so they stratified the analysis by these um, characteristics. So in um, uh, patients that were seronegative, the region CoV-2 um, antibody cocktail um, reduced viral load compared to placebo at day seven. 
Um, and um, it seemed to work better in higher dose um, compared to lower dose. Um, and it seemed to work better in seronegative patients uh, on the top bar compared to when you look at seronegative and seropositive patients combined. Um, when you stratify them by their viral load, um, it seems to me that the region of CoV-2 cocktail is more effective uh, at reducing viral load when you start out with more virus. Um, and so you can see the difference here. Here with placebo in the blue line, the treatment um, groups um, had a much greater reduction. Um, <clears throat> they did uh, try to quantify symptom relief. Um, and in the seronegative population, um, there seemed to be an earlier median time to symptom relief in the treatment arms compared to the placebo arm with um, uh, the treatment arms having a median time to symptom re resolution of around six to eight days compared to 13 days in the placebo. But they did not provide any p-values for analysis here. Uh, I uh, suspect that it's not statistically significant, but it's clearly different from the zero positive, uh, zero positive uh, population. Um, and um, that when they stratified the groups by viral load instead of zero positivity, they found that um, there was faster symptom relief in the group with the highest viral load here, um, with um, a median time resolution of symptoms of around six days uh, compared to 13 days in placebo. And um, this was kind of borderline. Um, they looked at doctor visits, um, and there were less doctor visits in the treatment arms, um, but uh, there was a very low number of doctor visits in total, reflecting that a lot of these patients just in general got better. It was only 12 doctor visits out of 275, um, and th these results were not statistically significant. And so in conclusion, um, in a group of adult patients with symptomatic COVID infection in the outpatient setting, the region CoV-2 antibody cocktail might be effective at decreasing viral load and alleviating symptoms versus placebo amongst patients who did not have evidence of serologic immune response or who had high viral loads at enrollment. And those two things are interrelated. It does not appear to work as well in patients who already have serologic antibody or who have low viral loads. There were less doctor visits compared to placebo, but that's underpowered. And uh, there was no increase in adverse events compared to placebo. And I didn't show that data, but there, uh, the adverse event rate was very low. So I have a few un unanswered questions looking through this unpublished data. Um, what is the real meaning of seronegativity versus high viral loads? Which one is more important? And which one is the indication for treatment that we should be thinking about? Um, and is there a relationship? There is a relationship between seropositivity and disease course. Um, but are there patients that um, are late in their disease course, but for some reason aren't seropositive that this might benefit as well? Um, how are symptoms measured? And is this really an important clinical endpoint for us? And are there other patient populations like exposure prophylaxis, hospitalized patients, critically ill patients where this would benefit? And indeed, Regeneron has other clinical trials where they're studying this exact question, but they haven't released any of that data. Thank you very much. Sonny, that was great. Very uh, concise review of um, some fairly limited evidence. And, and I, I want to put a plug in uh, to a session that we actually have in November that will be led by Hayden Schwank uh, from in Pediatric Infectious Disease. It will be devoted entirely to, to therapeutics. And we may have a little bit more data on that then. I want to remind folks, though, that until then, we have zero data uh, on children. Uh, and I also want to remind folks that um, uh, to be mindful of, of using ends of one and, and potential misattributions of causality and that a 70-year-old a, a man who is obese, who, who may have, certainly may be considered high risk, uh, would still be considered to, to have a highly favorable odds of, of a complete recovery and a good outcome. And so we have to just be careful about perpetuating those misattributions of causality. That's just simple evidence-based medicine, which is what this uh, series is all about. So with that, uh, Raji, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Sunny. Um, today, it is our pleasure to welcome three of our speakers who uh, have each extensive, um, uh, extensive work in vaccines as well as infectious disease. Uh, and I will introduce each of them before they start their talk. First up is Dr. Cornelia Decker. She is a professor emerita with pediatric infectious diseases at Stanford. She's a consultant to speak, which is safety platform for emergency vaccines. 
and is now focused on COVID-19 vaccine issues, such as developing consensus across the nations on issues like vaccine-enhanced disease. And she co-leads the Data and Safety Monitoring Board within SPEAK, advising on safety issues across different vaccine platforms. Thank you, Corey, and I will pass it along to you. Disclosures, you've heard already from, from Rashni that I work for a mouthful of acronyms here. I am a consultant for the CEPI group via the Brighton Collaboration Safety Platform for Emergency Vaccines or SPEAK project. Um, I'm also a member of this scientific advisory board for Medicago and consult with them on their influenza and COVID vaccine 19 candidates. So what I was hoping to cover today is give you a brief sense of what the COVID-19 landscape looks like, uh, how COVID-19 vaccine development compares to vaccine development, a little bit about the statistical basis for the design of the United States phase three efficacy trials, and a comparison of the endpoints for those trials. So in terms of efficacy trial design considerations, um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 themselves are now only about 11 months old. Given that, vaccines are expected to become available within the next six months. We have limited, and that should probably read no time, for trial and error with these vaccine candidates. The phase three efficacy studies are complex in normal times. However, these are not normal times anymore and no shortcuts are allowed to establish the vaccine effectiveness, safety, and trust, all of which are crucial for public acceptance of the vaccine that will eventually come out, or vaccine candidates, I should say. This is a busy slide. Uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of where we are. The slide itself is taken from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which came out in May 21st. And as you can see along the top, it goes and lists the technology, attributes of the vaccines, candidates in preclinical development, and candidates in human clinical trials. And just before this talk, I looked on the WHO website. Uh, there are now 42 different vaccine candidates in clinical trials. So this is a way outdated slide, but I'll use it still to give you a sense of what the landscape looks like. Um, representing DNA vaccines and OVO pharmaceuticals is in the clinic. We have inactivated vaccine candidates represented by Sinovac and Beijing. In, this is a platform that we know well because we have a lot of inactivated vaccines already. Live attenuated vaccines are being considered and one is now already in the clinic. Uh, we have non-replicating vectors, protein subunits, replicating viral vectors, and lastly, the RNA vaccines, uh, which are represented here by Moderna and the BioNTech and Pfizer vaccines, both of which are now deep into phase three, and a host of others. Altogether, there are close to 200 vaccine candidates. So again, this is just a partial list, but to give you a sense that we really have um, quite a range of different vaccine candidates that may be coming through. This slide depicts the difference between, at the top here, normal vaccine development, and then on the bottom half of the slide, what's happening now with the COVID vaccines. And if we look first at the gray uh, arrows here that are representing manufacturing and scale up, this happens rather slowly during the one foot in front of the other, phase one, phase two, phase three, clinical development that is typical for vaccines. But you're not getting into large scale manufacturing until the licensure stage with a normal vaccine. In contrast, uh, things are happening much faster, certainly with the clinical development, but the biggest difference really is shown here at the bottom with the commitment for manufacturing. So for the COVID vaccines, uh, manufacturing development, scale up, the production of clinical trial material and validation processes happen very early. And by the time you're in the phase three efficacy trials, which 
for most uh, vaccine companies and developers so far has happened within a three to four month period, there's already large scale manufacturing that's ongoing. And this is really a huge financial risk that's being taken. Uh, it's worth it for the pandemic, but it's obviously not something that individual developers are gonna do normally when they, do this scale up process when they at least have some sense that safety has been cleared as a hurdle, even though they may not yet have the efficacy data which come at the end of phase three. So that gives you a sense of what's different. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of other differences. Regulatory um, agencies are looking at these candidates and looking at data over time rather than waiting until the end where you submit a whole package. So all of that contributes to the fact that we have a pretty fast um, process ongoing and it's specific for the pandemic because there are groups that have made this upfront risk in the manufacturing. So the COVID prevention network prototype trials, each of the phase three trials that's done per vaccine candidate has a population of about 30,000 adults that are at risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 disease. There's not gonna be pre-screening for this, so we won't know in the beginning how many people had already been infected, either symptomatically or not, although they shouldn't have had a, an obvious clinical uh, disease. The randomization in these trials is either two to one or one to one, and that's the developer's choice. Um, and it's vaccine to placebo, obviously, and some are actually uh, randomizing within risk strata. Follow-up is going to be for two years post last vaccination, and the primary endpoint is virologically confirmed symptomatic disease. So here is uh, a schematic of the follow-up and sampling schedule. As you can see, all the candidates so far are two-dose vaccines that are in the clinic, so Doses are given at day one and day 29. Then there are regularly scheduled clinic follow-up visits at which time blood is being taken to assess seroconversion. And then there are the participant contacts for symptom triggered NP swabs, anterior nasal swabs or saliva cups that then are collected and tested centrally. And if there's a positive result, they enter into another uh, aspect of the protocol that we'll talk about on this next slide. So for symptomatic cases that have a positive diagnosis um, of SARS-CoV-2, they will go into a three-week, 21-day uh, self-assessed symptoms with nasal swabs starting every other day for the first 10 days and a blood draw that happens at the beginning of that process. On day 21, if the SARS-CoV-2 test is still positive, then they continue follow-up with these nasal swabs and another blood sample at day 28 until resolution of symptoms. If they're negative at day 21, then they come back at day 28 for blood draw and nasal swab. So looking at the endpoints, here is the common primary endpoint for all of the phase three efficacy trials, and it's COVID symptomatic infection. Uh, virologically confirmed, uh, you have to have symptoms in order to trigger this. There are, however, some key secondary endpoints, positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR or seroconversion defining all SARS-CoV-2 infections. And over here on the bottom, uh, as a branch of the COVID symptomatic infections, the trials will be looking for severe COVID disease as well to determine efficacy against that. In terms of when the primary analysis will be happening, uh, this is event driven. And for the trials that are randomized two to one, they'll stop for the primary analysis after 150 events have accrued. The one-to-one -one ratio will have 170 events. The trials are sized such that with conservative assumptions, this primary analysis is likely to take place within about seven months of the start of the trial. 
Continued blinded follow-up, however, after this seven-month time point, roughly, is going to be necessary in order to evaluate the duration of vaccine efficacy, which is a secondary objective, and to adequately power the secondary endpoint of vaccine efficacy against severe COVID disease. Because that's a subset of all of these events, these are all symptomatic, uh, you need to have longer follow-up in order to accrue more cases um, to get this vaccine efficacy endpoint of severe COVID disease. This is my last slide. Um, this is what happens depending on what the outcome of the interim and primary analysis shows. If the efficacy criteria are met, shown here on the left, they will stop randomizing cases. The blinded follow-up will continue the result is reported publicly, and a select group of investigators are provided the unblinded data so that they can pr produce reports. Over on the right is the worst case. No <laughs> or in fact, if there's an increased risk of disease that gets shown. Again, randomization stops. The oversight group determines whether and how long to continue the blinded follow-up at this point. And if demonstrated vaccine harm or a major concern is determined, then the participants may be unblinded and notified so that they can obtain adequate follow-up. And lastly, that result also was reported publicly. Uh, in the middle is perhaps a more likely scenario here, no criteria are met. Well, that's easy. Randomization and follow-up will cont continue as planned for these trials. Thank you. Uh, with that, Roshni, I'm going to set it back to you. Thank you, Corey, very much. Uh, there was just one question that uh, hopefully we can just take it now. Um, it was about the de definition of symptomatic disease. Uh, does that vary between different uh, trials, uh, uh, different vaccine trials? Uh, what is the definition of symptomatic? Yeah, the, it, there, there are some differences in that definition, but they're at the margins, I think, is what people would say. Um, obviously, the, there is uh, the respiratory distress, shortness of breath, fever, cough. Uh, any of those occurring will be fairly common, I think, amongst all of the trials that are ongoing. Um, but there are some slight, slight variations in terms of how the developers have uh, actually defined that definition. And this is what they discuss with the regulators and, and what gets approved in their final protocols. Thank you, Corey. And we'll take questions at the end, uh, but we will move on now to our next speaker. Um, I am very happy to welcome Dr. Nicola Klein. She is a board certified pediatrician. She's the director of Kaiser Permanente Vaccine Study Center since 2006. She's a professor in the Department of Health System Sciences at Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. She has worked extensively in vaccine safety and effectiveness and will be leading the vaccine safety data link rapid cycle analysis, which will be monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety. She is the principal investigator on numerous vaccine clinical trials and is currently the PI for Pfizer's phase three clinical trial evaluating the safety and efficacy of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Nikki. I, I will hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Roshni. Advance the slides. There we go. Okay, so here are my disclosures. Um, as, uh, I do receive funding from Pfizer for the mRNA vaccine trial, as, as Rashi mentioned, as well as uh, funding from almost all major vaccine manufacturers for unrelated studies as well. So for today, the goals of the presentation are really just to give a very bird's eye view and a thousand foot thoughts about the US vaccine safety monitoring system, and then to briefly describe the plans for monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety. So just a brief word that when you think about vaccine safety, you just we do actually have to think about it a little bit differently than we do about drug safety in that there is a higher standard of safety, um, typically because vac vaccinees are generally healthy and maybe very young is, is particular to this audience as you are well aware. 
uh, vaccinations may be universally recommended or mandated. And just for all these reasons, there's just a much lower risk tolerance for, a, for example, a vaccine adverse event something along the lines of less than one in 100,000 for a, an adverse event versus the risk for a drug adverse event, which may just vary from everyone getting it depending on the indication for the drug up to one to one, one in a thousand, for example. Now, we just heard about some of the pre-licensure studies, which are pivotal and key for both efficacy and safety of any new vaccine. And we just heard some of the uh, placebo, uh, some of the protocols for the randomized blinded placebo control design. And, and these are wonderful advantages. There's close detailed follow-up. And of course, they're blinded and they can be controlled. However, there are disadvantages in that the rare or delayed reactions are often can be difficult to detect. Um, and then typically the vaccine, vaccine trials do not necessarily include uh, subpopulations. And we won't know what happens with those subpopulations. So, when you start to think about vaccine safety, I, I think that probably everyone on this call is quite aware but that they're for the need for ongoing vaccine safety programs. So this is this classic uh, graph from Bob Chen published in the early 1990s. And typically when I show this slide, I usually like to, I hope you can see my pointer, we're usually thinking about what happens here with vaccine safety because we're worried about uh, in, increasing vaccine coverage and there may be a loss of confidence and then there's an outbreak of a disease because of decreased vaccine coverage. And so this is usually the, the place at which we start to think about vaccine safety and as it affects public health. However, right now I think we are in an Un, as you know, to be, not to be too cliche, but the unprecedented time of looking, thinking about COVID-19 vaccines, oops, excuse me, um, vaccines and vaccine safety here at this point, which we don't even have a vaccine yet available, but they anticipate, but it should, it's to be anticipated that there probably will be one soon. And so we're here trying to get increasing vaccine coverage in the, in the face of this pandemic. However, at the same time, what we're having here is already a questioning and a possible loss of confidence. And so we might be having these two things happening at the same time. And so this is just really highlights and reflects the need for even more enhanced safety monitoring for COVID vaccine safety so that this actually doesn't come to pass. So in terms of generally, what is, what is generally the um, post license for vaccine safety monitoring? So I've highlighted it at the ones in asterisks are more enhanced vaccine safety for COVID-19, but most of these are actually things that are ready in place that we've been doing for a long time. The first one is that the CDC has a very pivotal role in vaccine safety monitoring out of what's known as the Immunization Safety Office, and that includes the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, also known as VAERS. There's something new called VaxSafe, which is for COVID. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now there's the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Network, and then the Vaccine Safety Data Link Project, and I'll talk about those briefly in a few minutes. Uh, the FDA also does have a role for post-licensure vaccine safety monitoring, and currently, right now, it inc incorporates um, the Sentinel Initiative, which is an insurer and payer database, and that focuses mainly on drug safety, but they also do do some vaccine safety as well. And this is typically 100 million uh, covered lives. That's what the number for Sentinel usually includes. And then in addition, there's uh, what's called BEST or the Biologics Effectiveness and Safety Program. And this is um, CMS data monitoring, which includes uh, 650,000 long-term care facility residents. Now, finally, the vaccine manufacturers also have a role in vaccine safety monitoring. And typically, these are in the form of an FDA-required phase four vaccine safety studies. These can typically be on the order of 10,000 up to 50,000 people or more. Um, and these are vaccines that are monitored as part of um, safety monitored in, as part of routine vaccine use. And um, just as to note, we've done quite a few of these studies within Kaiser, um, which we look at the data for um, people who receive vaccines as part of routine care. So 
spending a minute on the vaccine adverse event reporting system. So this is a passive system. It's co-managed by the FDA and the CDC, and it's been around since 1990. This is web-based reporting for suspected adverse events, and this reporting can come from physicians, patients, et cetera, sometimes even lawyers. Um, but there's also public access to the data. Anyone can report anyone there's no you don't have to justify why to do it and it's for anyone who thinks there's been an adverse event for any reason it's national in scope it's very timely um, in particular for the COVID-19 enhanced uh, reporting there'll be the reporting report processing times will be daily data sets and the reports will be evaluated within one day for death reports so then three days for serious reports and five days for non-serious reports uh, it's considered a system, a generation of hypothesis for generating signals. And um, it's going to be part of an enhanced VAERS reporting using the National Healthcare Safety Network or NHSN sites, which will be facilitating reports for healthcare workers or long-term care facilities. And again, this is part of enhanced vaccine safety monitoring in addition to uh, normal VAERS reports that happen. So this is one of that, this is what um, that VSAFE I mentioned uh, briefly is that this is an enhanced COVID vaccine response. Um, this is a VSAFE is a smartphone uh, based text, text a web survey and email the survey. Um, they will be actively surveilling early vaccine recipients, and, um, mainly essential workers and healthcare workers. Um, this has been estimated to be up to ready to monitor for up to 20 million vaccine recipients in the early in the early months and there'll be text messages or emails from the CDC for vaccine recipients and then anyone who a pair who reports any possibly clinically significant um, event will get a uh, reported to VAERS and then they will follow up also with the healthcare workers themselves. So a brief word about the clinical the CISA network and this was established, and this is again managed by the Immunization Safety Office. So this is established in 2001 as a national network of medical research centers with expertise in immunization safety. Uh, the goals are to improve understanding of adverse events after following immunization at an individual patient level, to assist the CDC in evaluating emerging vaccine safety issues, and most relevant for current times is that it will serve as a vaccine safety resource for U.S. healthcare providers with complex vaccine safety questions about specific patients to assist with immunization make decision making. And this has been an activity that, that um, CISA has been performing for a long time, but right now as part of the enhanced CISA COVID-19 vaccine clinical console service, there will be 24-7 coverage um, availability for clinical consults for vaccine adverse events. Now a word about the vaccine safety data link also through the Immunization Safety Office. So this is a collaboration between the CDC and eight integrated healthcare delivery systems of which you'll note that um, Kaiser does comprise a, uh, the majority of these sites, but not exclusively. It started in 1991, it includes about 10 million people, which is uh, about just over 3% of the American population. And with the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD, is an active surveillance and of newly licensed vaccines. It also is, um, evaluates the vaccine safety of new recommendations for existing vaccines, for vaccine at high risk populations, particularly pregnant women and other groups as well. It also develops new methodologies for vaccine safety assessments. And finally, it also tests, it's a, it's a system for testing hypotheses noted by signals from VAERS, from clinical trials, and from other platforms that might be, um, it might, signals might come up. And it just conducts a lot of vaccine safety research in general. So one quick word about a particular type of vaccine VSD study is what's known as a rapid cycle analysis. And this is an ongoing surveillance of targeted outcomes. And this has uh, been some of the VSD has been conducting for all newly licensed vaccines since about 2005, 2006. And it gets weekly updates of all the data from all the uh, sites for the VSD. And that data is evaluated on a weekly basis for those targeted outcomes of interest. Now, I've just included an example. So of uh, the measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, MMRV vaccine was the first example of an RCA detected safety signal 
um, in which we identified increased risk of febrile seizures seven to 10 days after MMRV as compared to MMR plus V. And you can see this in the graph below in which you see that uh, the blue line indicates uh, seizures after MMRV and the pink line is the seizures seven to 10 days after MMR plus separate varicella vaccine. And so this has, since this time, and there's been many vaccines that have been monitored using these real time uh, updates. And um, this has become really one of the key and very valuable tools that the VSD has in terms of monitoring in real time new vaccines as they are started and being rolled out. And for COVID vaccines, the um, planning's already underway to start to plan to, to when the first vaccines are given within a population, um, the, the rapid cycle analysis for the COVID-19 vaccines will be ready to go on day one. And we can start to monitor and look at data weekly for um, outcomes of interest. So in this last slide, um, I'm just giving you a list here. So this is a long list, it's very busy, but I just want to give you an idea. These are the particular studies that are currently um, either confirmed or tentative, only planned that the CDC is sponsoring um, for COVID vaccine safety. Um, there's going to be the rapid cycle analysis I just mentioned. There's vaccine safety in pregnant women and their infants. There's going to be vaccine enhanced COVID-19 disease monitoring. Uh, there's some uh, evaluations of changes in healthcare utilization due to the pandemic and how that might impact uh, vaccine adverse events encounters. Um, we're going to be monitoring both influence and COVID-19 vaccine coverage in pregnant women. And then finally, uh, looking at COVID-19 disease um, in pregnancy and fetal death. And then I mentioned CISA will be uh, doing an enhanced 24-7 clinical consult service for vaccine adverse events. And then there's a list of potential VSD and other CISA studies, which um, I won't uh, go through in great detail, but I just want to let you, those may, may or may not uh, still come to pass, but that's what is potentially on the docket right now. And this is, I think, um, with that, I think I will stop and turn it over. Thank you very much, Nikki. We have a lot of questions coming in and we are going to hopefully get to um, some of them, at least many of them, after Grace's talk. Um, I would now like to welcome Dr. Grace Lee. She is a professor of pediatrics uh, infectious diseases at Stanford. She's also an associate chief medical officer at Lucille Packer Jones Hospital at Stanford. Uh, she's a board member for the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, or SHEA. She's also the board member of uh, Pediatric Infectious Disease Society and the National Academy of Medicine Board on Population Health and in Public Practice. Uh, Dr. Lee is the vice chair of CDC's Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, or ACIP. Uh, she's a member of the COVID Vaccine Working Group and the chair of COVID Vaccine Safety Technical Work Group. Welcome, Grace. Um, thanks very much. Uh, so I was tasked with perhaps just walking this group through the process and you know, happy to talk about what's the same or different. Um, but uh, I've actually been surprised that a lot of people, and perhaps uh, maybe because we live in a pediatric world, many of us know what the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is. Um, but I share these slides in part because there are um, many individuals who have never heard of ACIP until COVID vaccines hit. So it's been an interesting time. Um, as uh, you know, it was just uh, clearly articulated by Dr. Decker and Dr. Klein, uh, there's a phase of vaccine development and testing. Um, we're still clearly in the phase one, two, and a few vaccines are in the phase three clinical trial stage. Um, and typically what would happen is that the submission of that data would go to FDA for a BLA or biologics licensing application. Um, as many of you know, uh, much of what's been discussed lately with regard to COVID vaccines is whether or not it would go under emergency use authorization or would go for full FDA licensure. Um, the typical process again after FDA licensure, um, there is a independent, and I, I mentioned this because there's actually two independent committees um, that are federal advisory committees and VRPAC actually advises the FDA and ACIP advises the CDC. VRPAC really focuses on the regulatory use of vaccines and thinks about the benefit risk assessment of any biologics and in this particular case vaccines. 
Um, and ACIP generally considers the use of those vaccines in the US civilian population. So after FDA licensure, it would come to um, ACIP for consideration and ACIP makes recommendations about use, which typically then go to the CDC director and get published in MMWR. And then of course, there's all of these other um, logistical considerations where actually, which are actually huge <laughs> this time around with COVID-19 vaccines, but financing and impl implementation and with in particular implementation will be the challenge. Um, just to reiterate that ACIP uh, has been in place for a very long time. It was established in 1964 to provide advice and guidance to the director of the CDC on the use in civilian populations based on these particular characteristics. So we consider disease epidemiology, vaccine safety, vaccine efficacy and effectiveness, the quality of the evidence reviewed, economic analyses and implementation issues. And I think what's a little bit different about ACIP compared to um, any other federal advisory committee is that we actually do consider cost effectiveness as one component. Um, that clearly will not be the driving component at all for COVID vaccines, but it is unusual um, in that we actually consider that part of our mandate. Um, I bring these up just because, uh, again, most people don't realize where the recommendations for child, adolescent, and adult immunization uh, uh, recs come from. So um, these are the recommendations we use every day as pediatricians and our adult colleagues use as well, uh, just to put it in context of this is typically our uh, process. Uh, we have 15 ACIP members with various expertise and perspectives that are listed here. And you can see um, that's the group at the inner table. And at the outer table, I'll highlight that we actually have eight ex officio members um, from uh, federal agencies and 33 liaison organizations that are all involved in um, vaccines in one way, shape, or form. Um, and I'll, you know, for example, Bonnie Maldonado, our Division Chief for Infectious Diseases, is uh, there uh, for the AAP and uh, plays a very important role. Um, in February of 2018, so I will say since 2012, actually, ACIP adopted what's called the GRADE framework uh, for considering the benefits and risks of any particular vaccine. But in addition, we ended up um, adopting what's called an evidence to recommendations framework because um, there was a recognition that decision making is a complex process and depending on the 15 members that are sitting at the table, you could be given the same evidence and come to different decisions about use of a vaccine in the population. Um, the ETR framework was adopted in order to enhance transparency and decision making, consistency of the implementation of the approach we use, and specifically to communicate deliberations and judgments made during the formulation of recommendations. In particular, it's been helpful to have this, uh, this tool as a way to express dissenting views or minority opinions. And these are the components of the evidence to recommendations framework um, that we use in ACIP or we have been using since 2018. And we are gonna lean on this absolutely uh, for COVID-19 vaccines. So typically, you know, we ask about the problem. Is a problem of public health importance? Um, we think about the benefits and the risks. So, you know, is the intervention, ex um, uh, what, what is the magnitude of the benefits, the magnitude of the risks and the balance of those in addition to what is a certainty of our knowledge about those benefits and risks. Um, we think about the values of those who are being vaccinated. Um, and as you, as you know, uh, uh, it's gonna be a really um, important aspect of being able to deliver vaccines uh, with COVID-19. Uh, we take a look at acceptability. So is it acceptable to key, key stakeholders? And actually for this, it's actually related to um, ethically, programmatically, and financially. And you can see um, in particular with regard to ethical frameworks for vaccination and early vaccine allocation, this has been a, um, a really uh, uh, robust uh, and uh, terrific source of having conversations about some of the inequities that we've seen in our health system. Uh, we also consider resource use, uh, usually cost effectiveness analysis, and then feasibility. Is it feasible to implement and are there any barriers to implementation? And again, a huge consideration. Um, there, we, what's um, implicit in this framework is equity, but I will say that um, what COVID-19 has done for us at least is um, obviously this has got to be explicitly incorporated equity as a principle um, in any vaccine recommendations. And in fact, I think we're um, you know, rethinking uh, about how to actually build an equity explicitly into our evidence to recommendations criteria. But for COVID-19 vaccines, it is uh, clearly an overarching and in almost every single one of these domains, something that's incredibly important. 
Um, so these are the work group members for the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so you'll see here that we have a large group of individuals. We have been meeting, essentially the work group started uh, in April. Uh, we initially uh, met bi-weekly and we're now up to weekly. Um, and in addition to this, uh, I mean, Roshni mentioned, although I didn't put the slide up, that there is a vaccine safety technical subgroup that I chair that specifically is looking at all aspects of base vaccine safety, uh, pre-authorization or pre-licensure, as well as once a vaccine does come to market, then we will take a look at all of the safety data uh, in that post-market phase. Um, so, I mentioned that the work group is meeting, meeting weekly. We've already reviewed phase one, two data from manufacturers as data become available. And we are looking forward to reviewing the phase three data when it becomes available. Um, the uh, ones that data do become available, which um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about when that would be, uh, we do anticipate conducting an independent review of the safety and efficacy data. We'll use the evidence to recommendations framework and the grade process in all of this. And then the full um, ACIP will hear all of the options based on the work group deliberations. Um, we anticipate having an emergency meeting with a public comment session whenever the FDA decision is announced. Um, and we'll vote on recommendations for vaccine use then. I think one of the challenges we've run into is that implementation of COVID vaccines is going to be complex. It's not like anything we've ever seen before in that there are so many vaccine candidates with different um, uh, storage and handling considerations with different numbers of doses that are using different platforms. So uh, the sheer implementation challenges are, are, um, are of course, weighing in, are, th are thinking about the recommendations uh, in addition to the safety and effectiveness. Um, and then after an ACIP vote, we'll submit our recommendations to the CDC director. I think what's unusual in this case, uh, let me just see if there's another slide here. Um, I think what's unusual in this case, oh, well, let me do one more thing. So um, in terms of the path to COVID-19 vaccine recommendations, this was just on Tuesday. This was literally what happened like in 12 hours on Tuesday. Um, oh, uh, actually, Monday night, they published that the White House blocks a new coronavirus vaccine guidelines. So for those of you who have been following the news closely, um, in July, June, July, actually, FDA came out with specific guidance around the characteristics of the vac COVID-19 vaccines that they wanted to see. So for example, um, efficacy of 50% with a lower bound of 30%. And I actually th think that guidance was excellent and extremely helpful for aligning um, some of the um, uh, trials that are coming through now. Um, and in addition, we had been waiting uh, for most of uh, August and September for the FDA guidance to come out that apparently did get pushed out on September 21st uh, with regard to other considerations, in particular safety and what FDA would be expecting um, and how much follow-up would be needed. So the White House actually blocked it for two weeks, then FDA released it uh, via the VRPAC meeting. So that if you wanted to take a look at what their guidance is, take a look at the anticipated October 22nd meeting. It's a public and open meeting and the uh, Federal Advisory Committee for FDA will be deliberating um, or bringing that document into view. And then later that night, the White House reversed their um, decision and they decided to go ahead and accept the FDA guidance. Um, so it's been a little bit dizzying to see what's going on. I kind of just have to wait for every the news cycles to kind of pass through to figure out where we need to head. But I think in general, our goal has been to focus on, um, you know, staying the course, taking a look at all the evidence to date and the recommend uh, and thinking about our recommendations. And I'll, I'll point out that the one unusual thing about um, this particular framework that I, I have not experienced before in my four years on ACIP has been that we typically always start with the problem and the benefits and the risks. Um, so we start with the scientific data we have in hand, and then we add in all these additional layers and domains that actually reflect um, the complexity and influence our decision making. In this instance, we have actually started here with the values, acceptability, resources, and feasibility. And we have been waiting and waiting for that phase three trial data to come in. So we haven't been able to deliberate on the benefits and risks yet, which is why we can't make any clear recommendations until we have that phase three trial data in. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, we will try and do like a rapid fire answers to some of the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Decker, for actually uh, already answering some of the questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, I think one of the questions that we would uh, probably we should just address up front is um, any information about when this might roll out to children 
um, the vaccines and where are we in that process, if at all, we know. And I can open it to any of you to take that as a stab at that. So I can just say that at least I, I know for sure that one manufacturer, and, and I think others have also stated at ACIP that they are planning to do clinical trials in children. Um, I think the timing is a little bit more up in the air on that, but at least I know some of them have announced that they are, will be doing trials in children. The majority have said so. I think the main thing is, is that we really need them to enter phase one, two trials. And I don't believe, unless Corey knows of anything or Nikki, um, I've heard of any that have entered phase one, two trials. And we need that because you can't just launch into phase three trials, I, I think. <laughs> uh, well, I think there'll probably be some bridging studies with the older kids and then eventually move down to the younger kids is, is my estimate. The trials do go down to the age of 16, I believe now. Yeah, that's the youngest. But I, we haven't hit anything close to the um, school age population yet. Right. Thank you. Um, there's a question for you, Grace. Uh, will ACIP provide recommendations regarding um, monoclonal antibodies like Regeneron, since these are being evaluated for prevention as well, similar to synergies? Uh, it's a really great question. That actually, I have to say, it hasn't come up, and uh, in part because I, I think we've been so focused on all the vaccines that are coming through. Uh, we do sometimes consider biologics, but that's not been one of the things on the docket for us. Um, perhaps, Corey, um, any comment on AstraZeneca study on hold in the U.S. and not in the rest of the world? Is there anything we can infer from that? Honestly, I don't think so. Um, you know, the, all of the, there are different regulators involved. The, the rest of the world has their own regulatory bodies that, that meet with the developer. Uh, I, I don't know what the holdup is in terms of the U.S. in particular. Um, I just don't have any information and those are things that just happen between AstraZeneca and, and FDA. Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, uh, tagging along the uh, immunizations in children question, is it, is it safe to assume that adult immunization will be rolled out before we know anything about kids? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, says, yeah. I mean, we can't consider a recommendation for kids without any evidence, uh, even in the adult population yet. So um, agree with uh, Dr. Klein that uh, you know, we will, we will um, learn a lot from the safety and effectiveness in the adult population, but I think there are some unique considerations in kids, uh, in particular with safety that we're going to have to consider. So I, you know, I imagine that we are going to have to rely on phase three trial data for that. Yeah, I think there's another issue that is, um, if, if, if we are really, really lucky to get a biologic record of efficacy out of the clinical trials. And that would certainly make expansion into some of the other populations much, much easier because you would just target making, um, getting an equivalent response in kids as, as was shown in protected adults, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, may, it may take us longer to get there if we don't have the full data from the trials though. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the interesting things, I'll just chime in, is that the size of these trials are huge. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, each of these trials, you know, 30 to 50,000 uh, per trial gives us a huge amount of data on efficacy and safety. I mean, typically vaccine trials are much smaller in size and they take much longer. The size has been, uh, you know, out of necessity because in order to be able to determine efficacy, they have to have enough people who might be exposed to infection. But I also think it's a benefit for safety. As long as we're able to, you know, follow up on the data from those trials, um, we will actually probably have more pre-licensure data on vaccine safety than we ever typically have. I haven't seen trials this size since rotavirus vaccines, but, you know, I don't know, Corey or Nikki, if you've seen other similarly sized trials. I mean, I think that's a good point about them being much larger. The, the difference being that um, we're the expectation that there's going to be rolled out much faster. So we just don't have the time because there's no, we're not going to be waiting for the full two years, for example, for all the data to all come through before, to, I mean, in assuming that there's some sort of efficacy that before that they're actually rolled out to the public public at large. And so, you know, in a typical cycle, as Corey explained, you know, nicely explained, all of that data would be complete before the licensure application goes to the FDA. We would have that 
data in hand, but now I think we'll be generating it at the same time that people are being vaccinated, which I think in this case makes the post licensure vaccine safety, you know, real time monitoring that much more crucial um, in terms of trying to monitor and find out what's actually happening. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick one. Um, I have heard that COVID vaccines may help with severe disease, but may not affect nasal carriage. Is that true? Well, I can go ahead. And try. I, I don't think we have any evidence to say that right now. I think that we just don't know if that's true or not at this point. And I'll let other people chime in if they have anything else. I think the data that we have are for primates. And so there are some primate data where there are differences in but, but those are artificial models and they don't always predict what human responses are going to be. So uh, we have, we'll have to get data from these trials. And I think it's a really important question because, you know, right now, uh, most of the trials are focused on symptomatic infection, you know, plus or minus a subset that are severe, which is really important. However, you know, our hope is that this va the vaccine candidates that are coming through will interrupt transmission and being able to interrupt asymptomatic infection is going to be just as important. Um, right now, uh, it seems to me the most of the trials are capturing it through antibody response to capture asymptomatic infection. Um, but going forward, I think it'll continue to be an important part. We're assuming it'll interrupt transmission, uh, but that's based on symptomatic data. Um, thank you. Um, there's another question. How strongly are trials controlling for enrollees use of other medications like antiviral steroids during the trial? I, I, well, I can, I can answer. Um, there are certain criteria. The trial, trials in general always have very strict enrollment and eligibility criteria. And uh, the trials, the, these trials, as well as is really quite typical for most vaccine trials, um, there is usually some exclusion for some, some uh, steroid use, depending, depends on the trial, depends on the amount of steroids, but some, something around the order of more than two weeks of steroids typically would be exclusionary. Um, antivirals also depends on the trial. I, I don't know if there's anything in this particular, these particular ones speaking to antivirals. I, I'm assuming you mean, well, I mean, remdesivir, for example, you can't be using, rem, you can't have a history of using remdesivir, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a question from one of the participants who had to leave the conference and so wanted to make sure we answered the question and because these answers will not be available with the recording. I'm just going to point out, she had asked about storage and temperature considerations, and Corey had answered the question um, to say that DNA and RNA vaccines will be a problem uh, because they require extremely low temperatures for storage, but other candidates should be okay at refrigerated temperatures. Uh, so this might be particularly a problem for low resource countries. Mm -hmm. um, well, clearly it's a very important topic with a lot of questions and we couldn't get to every one of them, but I think we got to most of them. Um, I just wanna thank our uh, speakers uh, for your time, for your expertise and for sharing this very important information with us. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us. And as Alan pointed out next week, it's going to be about school. Um, so we would love to have you join us next week. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.